This is that one audition with Alicia Oxy. This is really so exciting. One, I didn't know that you listened to the podcast, but like I just told you, like you've been on the list forever. I've been doing interviews since 2009. Wow. And there's ever evolving lists and who has time and what's happening. And to also have you as a guest now that you've launched your podcast. What a joy. Welcome to the space. What a what a great idea and way to take your experience and be able to put it on mic to give the rest of us permission to hmm. deal with what we're dealing with in our lives and be totally messy. So I'm going to get to where we got on that. But holy moly, you started at seven. I did. I did. How? I will. I started at seven in the way that, you know, at least where I grew up. So I grew up on Long Island in New York and I did every extracurricular activity that all of the other little girls did. I'm the youngest of three. I had two older brothers that were five and eight years older. So they were all sports, sports, sports. And so by the time they were older and I was seven, you know, I expressed interest in dance class and, and things like that. And I'll never forget there was a musical theater class that was brought to the dance studio that I went to and they were going to do like little vignettes from the movie Annie. And I was so excited because it was my favorite movie. The My VHS tape had basically run out. I had broken it from watching it so many times and they were having us audition. And I remember they had us write down who we wanted to audition for. And I wrote down the dog, Sandy. Because Stop, I didn't just, really? like, yeah, it was like, I had no idea that I had any vocal talents or anything. I just thought that would be a fun role to play. And I ended up getting Annie. And I, I mean, all I needed was one person to be like, you can carry a tune that I said to my mom. Now I want singing lessons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, I would die for the end of the year recital. I couldn't wait to put on the costume and be up on the stage. It felt like home to me. I didn't have nerves. It was just pure excitement and joy. And I, I just didn't stop after that I, on Long Island. At all. That's At what, all. like, even just your bio where it was like play after play after play, mm -hmm. which it's so great. You know, my daughter is eight. So and she is in this space right now where Aww. she is alive on stage. And in my head, I've been in these, you know, pushback with also being in the industry and her begging now for auditions because she knows she sees me doing it. Yeah. Where I'm like, is it OK? When is it OK? Is it OK to take something that is fully uninhabited fully expressive. She's in a school play. There's no rejection associated with it yeah. into creating this job, right? It's yeah. a job. Yeah. Yeah. So when did There's, that switch happen where you're like, okay, I'm having fun. And now can I get paid to do this or like bigger? Yeah. I mean, I don't think it ever really... I don't think there was ever a question that that's what I, it, that it was what I wanted to do. And I, I'm really grateful to my parents that they didn't question it either. That being said, it was done in a safe space where like you're saying it was, it, it wasn't on a, a crazy large scale. It was just on Long Island in community theater. So it was just on the weekends. I was still in public school with my friends. There was some sense of normalcy. The first time that it stepped a little bit outside the bounds of that. So I used to read backstage magazine with my mom all the time and we would look for any musical Broadway auditions for girls my age. And I was always too tall. I don't know if people know this, but like musical theater auditions, when you would go in New York, but you, before you even walked in the room to sing or read, there would be a piece of tape on the wall and you would have to go stand next to it to see if, first of all, if you were under it, if you were over it, you're gone. Because if you think about it, they want you to last at least more than six months or hopefully a year in a show. So the shorter you were, the better. What? The longer you could you last know, in the role. Do you know the height requirement? Was it like five, five, five? I remember, six, was, I can, I, I'll, I'll, just the numbers popping in my head. I remember from four, six to four, ten. Like you were just always trying, I remember like kind of like trying to crouch underneath it just to just make the cut. But when I was 13 years old, I auditioned for, they were doing a national tour of the, an original musical of It's a Wonderful Life, the movie. 
And I remember waiting in the waiting room and all of these professional girls had their eight by 10 black and white headshots and their resumes. And all I had was like a little school picture. I had braces, like there was nothing professional about me at all, but I booked the job. And it was the first time that I had to really, mainly my dad, reason with him and and talk to him about it because i i'm also grew up jewish it was my bat mitzvah year there was a lot of obligations on my part there was a lot of sacrifice on my part and i remember having to make i don't think there was such thing as powerpoint then but like some sort of presentation to my parents of why i thought i should do it and how i could handle it and they gave me the shot and for four and a half, five months, I was on a bus and truck tour all over the United States doing this musical. And it was the best time of my life. I, I couldn't have asked for a better experience. And I would learn my Haftorah and send, send the tapes back to my cantor. And I would had a tutor and I, I didn't, I ended up coming back like ahead of schedule with school. And from then on, I think my parents trusted me that this could be, this could be something that I could pursue. Okay, so I have more of a like a mental health question and to see yeah. change because I think as an actor, knowing your why is everything. Mm-hmm. And I think your parents, unbeknownst to probably even them doing it other than just for you to maybe understand the gravitas of it or just not, do you remember what your why was in your presentation? Why I, I should booked, be allowed to do I, it? You're like, yeah, I booked it. So because I, I booked it. Mm-hmm. Because it felt like you were selected. I, yeah. Yeah. Like, I think I have what it takes. I think I can do this, which is so funny because as I'm sitting here saying this and talking about this with you now, you know, when you're so young, the why is so easy and simple. And I can just now like think of at least 20 times in my adult life where, you know, you question whether you should keep doing this or not, you know, and you get so lost and it's kind of nice to have reflect back to like my original why, because that spark is still in all of us. Right. That's why we keep trying. What's like the business starts to get in, starts to chip away at that. Why starts to chip away at that innocence. So Going from that, obviously, you know, you are talented. You know that talent exists. I hate to have to jump there, but after I listened to Edie Falco's episode this yeah. morning that you guys did of Messy, first of all, it brought me to tears. I'm yeah, still, she's like, amazing, I'm, isn't she? You all are. You all Thanks. are. And your ability to be so honest and transparent about your experience, we always can do that retrospectively. Of course. But to be on a massive show or be given that responsibility, you started Mm -hmm. at 16, 17 years old. 16, yeah. So basically three years after this, like, here's my presentation of why. And I'm going to go do this thing. I'm curious if you can speak about the ride to then getting this audition for Sopranos. And the, the difference of even at that age, going from film to television. Yeah, so after that i I came back home and continued to do musical theater on long island entered into high school i had maybe auditioned for like two or three tv projects and it's interesting because obviously the industry is much different now but i would get this like feedback that they couldn't quite place my type I wasn't all American enough. I, I'm also half Cuban. I wasn't Latina enough. Like there was just like, it was like, what is this girl? Who is she? And I just never thought TV would be for me. I, I, I was always focused on Broadway was the goal. Theater was the goal. And when I was 16 years old, there weren't many musical theater auditions for those types of ages. You know, now there's a lot of musicals for for kids that age, but it really was just like if you were their kid or you played, you know, grown up in these shows. And so I was a little frustrated and and missing working, but I was deciding that I was going to just be like every other Long Island kid and go to sleepaway camp that summer. Mm -hmm. And so I was ready to kind of let go and try that out. And right before I left, I got a call from my manager. I had this little manager out of Allentown, Pennsylvania. Her name was Lois Miller. Rest in peace, Lois. Sweet Lois. Lois. And she called my mom and she's like, you know, 
HBO is making a television program and it's a show called Sopranos. I don't have much information, but there's a daughter role. She's 16 and she has to look Italian. I think Jamie could pass for Italian. Why doesn't she go in? And I was like, okay, great. You know, I, I'll take a f- trip to the city with my mom and go, n- not thinking anything would ever come of it. And because of the title, I've told the story many times, I assumed it was musical. Right. (laughs) Because wouldn't you, if you have no other information, it's called The Sopranos? Yeah. And my first audition was just me and George Ann Walken and Sheila Jaffe in their little casting office in the city. And it was just a scene with Meadow and Carmela. And she wanted to go on a ski trip with her friend and she wasn't going to let her go. And I knew all about wanting to do things with my friends. And my mom was saying no. And I just channeled my life into it. I also had a very, very thick Long Island accent, which was, you know, real Mm -hmm. needed for the show. Absolutely. Right on point. You can't change that. Great. Yeah. And mu- and like much TV casting, it was a very fast process. It was then like, and I didn't have a cell phone at this time too. So you imagine I'm going home and on the answering machine when we get, when we take the train back to Long Island and I get home on the answering machine is up, they want to see her again. So the next day I went back in and I read for David Chase and Sheila and George Ann. And then I went back again the next day for all the producers. And then three days later, I had my test at HBO. So it was just like this really fast, crazy process. And I still had, I still fully believed I would never get it. And I think now having that sort of relaxed attitude that was very Meadow-esque Mm-hmm. What is, is what got me the role. I really was not attached, which again, now that I'm talking about it, I'm like, God, if I could just get an ounce of that back. Get that energy, right? Yeah, because it's you just, can't fake that energy. Okay. No, and it wasn't like what I needed or necessarily, because I kind of wanted to go to sleepaway camp more than get this mm-hmm. job at the time. Yeah. And then from then on, my life changed. Forever changed. Forever. And a show like that on HBO, even of that time, right? You don't really know what it is Mm -hmm. and it just blossoms into this. I don't want to give too much away because I really want people to go listen to your podcast. Oh, that's okay. We can talk about it. But I, you grew up on that set. Yeah. So during that time, you were still kind of working a little bit on a few other things, but I'm curious, what did you learn as an artist, what did you learn professionally? And then Mm. I really want to touch on personally dealing with certain things and how that allowed you to go on to other shows or work thereafter. Yeah. So, you know, the first two seasons of the show were fantastic. I was going through some person, I went through an eating disorder during the first two seasons. With all of that said, that show, they never cared the size I was. They only wanted me healthy. And it could not have been in a better situation for me, especially within this industry. I'm going through that for these people to just really care about my health, not my size. And so I was just so free those first two seasons. I really would learn my lines and that was it. And I would show up and just trust because as you can see, and if you watch the show and you know, I was in the best hands possible. I mean, working okay. with Jim Gandolfini and <laughs> Edie, I, I just remember we would have these dinner scenes and it would just be that dream situation where you don't even remember what your next line is, but you trust that it's going to come and you're in this flow of this scene. It just felt right. I, I, The second I walked on that soundstage, I felt like Meadow. I felt like Jim was my dad. I felt like Edie was my mom. And I was a teenager. I was living a very parallel life to her in many ways. And it was joyous and wonderful. And as the show went on, and as I had more personal struggle, unfortunately, because of my personality at the time and the enormity of the show at the time, I was so afraid to talk about anything that was going on. I didn't think, and it's nobody's fault. It's nothing anybody did, but I I didn't think that I would get the support 
that I needed and I didn't even know what support I needed that I the job started to feel different because I I I was trying to cover up what was going on inside of me and I just wasn't as loose as I had been before and there was a time in season five I'll never forget I came home and it was just a rough day at work and I got a call from them saying we need to get you an acting coach and it felt like I was the biggest failure on the planet I just looking at it as support yeah 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 and what I didn't realize was it was Jim Gandolfini and he was sending me his acting coach because he knew how badly I was struggling and he knew that I couldn't open up about it so it was his way of saying I'm going to send my girl to you and I'm going to get you straight with this so you can deal with what you need to on your own and that's just like him in a nutshell like he just he was so protective but never forced Mm -hmm. anything and I remember coming to work one day and she was there and she was there to work with both of us and he pulled me aside one day and he's like i just want you to know something jamie if this is something you want to do for the rest of your life everyone coaches like everyone coaches everyone needs a coach and he really reframed it for me which i so appreciate and i've taken with me ever since then and you know for all that i went through sopranos truly was like a safe place with that said like i confided to edie finally in the in the messy podcast despite all that i i really felt like an imposter and i really felt like i wasn't as good as everybody else well i think thank you for sharing that yeah even on the the show it's just so beautiful i think as artists or we were talking about this the other day on mike as well when you go from wanting something and your desire or longing for doing this started earlier or at least it was met with some of the work right so Mm -hmm the dream into the job and the job into a career. Those are so many different steps along the way. And we think that we have to do it on our own because then people are going to find out we don't know what we're doing. When in fact, so much of this of this uh, job requirement is your instincts, is the instrument that you're already in, is the life that you're living. And then and to get the job, right? Or get yeah. some jobs. And you were so right for Meadow. Nobody else could have played Meadow. Nobody else could have possibly done that. But then to get to a place of trying to figure out how to sustain this as a career, that you need that support. You need to come in with some sort of technique or you need to come in to understand what you're doing. So you're not solely relying on yourself and your instrument or your life lessons that might not work for the character of the story anymore. And so many people balk at saying that I use a coach and I'm I'm so grateful. I have a coaching right after this. Like I yeah. I I don't know how sometimes to do some of these things without support so that I don't get so lost in it. Right. Um, especially when you're on a series or you have the responsibility of a of a character for year after year after year. Mm-hmm. Yeah what a gift, but like how scary. And everybody seems to have it. Everybody seems to have this imposter syndrome. No, I'm doing it myself or I'm going to hide, which is why I think this podcast for me has been so helpful. It's kept me in the game, but hearing how other people do it and how they have their support system so that we're all together. Like, yeah. I mean, if you think about athletes, like the greatest ones in the world, they all have they have coaches, you know, it's not like they just show up and do it and they practice and they practice and they practice. And I think that, you know, when you do it as a kid, it's just joy and it doesn't feel like practice or rehearsal. And obviously there is a shift and that shift happened to me during that show, you know, where you're coming out of that adolescence and you're becoming more of an adult and you have to like compartmentalize things in your life and what's going on. And I, I didn't realize that there could be somebody that could help me do that. What are some of the tangible things that that coach started working with you on? Because you had a great basis, right? Of yeah. Training. So, but I'm curious what you picked up and what you were able to bring then into the world of even auditioning after that. So I want to get to auditioning after this. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's a whole journey. 
I I remember that she, her name was Susan Aston. She, we would do a lot of improv, which was really cool. Like we would, she, we would, she would bring me the scene that she had. I remember it was like, one of them was, you know, when Tony was in a coma and he had been shot and she was having this scene where she was explaining what was going on. And she was like, okay, Jamie, put the script down. You know, this world, you know, these people, let's just play. Like, let's just let's just improv this whole thing out. And so every time we would rehearse a scene, we would put the lines away once we knew what the what the story was and we would just play and it became joyful again for me. It became it became not a game, but it just became more of a like reaction and 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 listening and not thinking about the lines and not thinking about what I should be doing. And it just it brought me back to my original instincts which which is what I needed to finish that job. That's beautiful. That's, yeah. That, I mean, that's everything. If you can have somebody come in and just shake you up. Because even, you know, I'm wondering if television, I can't remember if The Sopranos kind of operated the same way the television works now, is you have guest directors coming in. You have people oh, yeah. that are unfamiliar with the material and you mm-hmm. and they're looking to you almost to yeah. know certain things. And I can't imagine being at that fragile age of being a teenager and trying to figure out who you are yeah during that time but I also feel like that happens for anybody when they get their first responsibility as a series regular of course and like going back to what we were talking about like with your daughter and like Christina and I talk about this a lot because you know we both you know she started on married with children at 15 and she was on that show for 11 years and so we kind of have the similar like beginning stories but it is an incredible amount of responsibility for a child it really is and it's and and it's not normal and obviously we've survived but i think there's parts of us now that we are unpacking and trying to heal that we didn't realize were heavily affected by that yeah and it's such a train right you get on the train the train's going so fast you're working 15 mm-hmm. 16 18 hour days more than any other child at that teenager at that mm-hmm. point you can't i don't even know if you could be aware of that till almost 10 years later once you finally slow down yeah but that's that's the real like mind fuck is that mm-hmm. like when the train stops for a minute when you're on that speed train in the beginning of your career And if it slows down and if you even have to get off the train and wait at the station for a little while, it really messes with you. And I had a manager, thankfully, that has told me, and I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but we'll go back, you know, not too long ago when I had one of those moments where I was like, I'm done. I think I'm done. And he was like, Jamie, I promise you the difference between a lot of people in this business is if you can just wait at the station long enough for the train to come back. Like, I'm just telling you to hang on and just wait. And I always think about that and I always remember, but it is hard when you, your first ride is around the world, you know, first class. The first class and you have nothing else. You just, I would expect then, right? That it's gonna stay at that and there's no way to sustain And you can't help but feel like a failure when it's not. Yes, so can we talk about that? Yeah, off the soprano train. And I was curious and even just looking at your resume and stuff, we know that Sheila did Entourage. Mm -hmm. Was that an offer? Was that like, oh, come play here? Yeah. So there was a little bit of time in between. So I moved to L.A. right when it was done because I just wanted to try it out and see and have some fun. I was 25, 26 years old. And I had this thing where I wanted to be in a comedy. I wanted to try a comedy. My very first audition was for this sitcom. I can't even remember what it was for. I didn't, I I remember it had went into my producer session and you know, it was just like one of those moments where you just, you're nailing it and everybody's dying laughing. And you're like, I'm not even trying. This is amazing. Oh my God, it's my first audition. This is working out great. I have, then I find out I'm gonna test. And it's like, I had forgotten what testing was like the process with h with sopranos was just so fast and it wasn't like studio network it just it had just felt like another callback now in a big building with hbo on the side of it so before i had tested jason bateman was directing it 
and I had a work session with him and I remember he was so lovely and he was giving me these tips and tricks where he was like, you know what, my, I always tell actors, just stay busy, just have, have a pen in your hand, have a pad, like just keep your body busy, just keep yourself loose. And I went in for the studio, went great, awesome. And the next day was going in, it was at Fox with all the executives and the nerves just got me. And I tanked and I knew I tanked and it just felt terrible. And I, I left and I just was confused. You know, I, like I said, I was just coming off like Sopranos and what are you going to do next? And then it was like, like, and it was kind of crickety for a minute. Was it after that? Yeah. You know, even like I would still get traction on a lot of these pilots, but it was a lot of like, I can't get past Meadow. I I can't. I got a lot of it. I got a lot of it. I can't think Meadow's funny or, you know, they just it it was it was hard. It was really, really hard. And so for Entourage, Doug Allen, the creator, and I had always kind of run into each other at HBO parties and stuff. And I loved the show. And I would always come over and tell him how great I thought it was. And he had said to me, you know, I have this funny idea for, you know, you want to come on and play yourself and do this thing with Turtle. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like fun. Thank you. And didn't think it was ever going to be more than that one episode. And we all had a great time. And I remember Doug pulling me aside and he's like, do you want to hang around here? And I was like, he's like, I know you're going to be playing yourself. Like, tell me, because I can see this story going and then even you coming back next season. And it was just this beautiful gift from Doug. And I think the universe, because it was on the same channel, Mm -hmm. probably a lot of the same audience. I'm playing myself we're talking about Sopranos, like there's not too much of a distance, but it's just like a little step out of it, a baby step out of that world. And it truly was the greatest gift and transition I could have ever asked for. That was going to, that you just answered my question because I was so curious. It felt, it felt a little meta. Yeah. Whether or not you felt fully accepting of it. And if it was that planned ahead of time or if it, it was wasn't, kind of- it was very organic. It was very organic. And it allowed me to sort of, again, kind of relax into myself a little bit and, and find a groove again that I had lost for like a couple of months. And it was and it was getting scary for me. Well, and it it does. It, this whole audition process makes you question who you are as a talent, but auditioning and being on set are two totally different muscles and not enough Completely. people talk about that. Even down to your audition of like nailing it on that day and everything's working, the jokes are working. And then the next day you don't sleep very well or you don't, mm-hmm. something is just slightly off. And then that can skew the whole audition process you were absolutely probably wonderful in that role. But that day, that audition, it was meant to go some it was meant to go somewhere else. But right? that's the thing. It wasn't mine. And I, I really have come to trust in myself and my efforts and what I do and also in the universe and its greater plan that it's just it didn't click for me that day because it wasn't mine, you know? Yeah, it wasn't the time and space. But I also want to acknowledge that, you know, during all of this, there was still this undercurrent. While it wasn't as strong as it got later on, of hiding the fact that I had MS. This is going to be my next question. Thank you yeah. for going there. And I was going to say, when did? How do you? I also deal with a chronic illness that nobody wants to acknowledge. And it's been really hard Mm. for me to show up every day. And there's inconsistencies Mm -hmm. because I can't control when I'm doing well and do not doing well. Yeah. And I don't want to not work. Yeah. Right. I would be so, this is, thank you so much. Mm. Will you walk through, yeah, how you reconcile? Because your instrument is your, that's, I know. that's what it's we're your body. It's your body. Yeah. It's what we're bringing to every role and every story. And if your instrument is struggling as Jamie, how are you able to bring it to all these other characters? Yet you need this job so you can pay your insurance. Mm-hmm. Take care of the body. It's such yeah. a tornado. Yeah. Yeah. It was hard. It was really, really hard because I didn't tell anybody. 
You're so you're and I was in LA and, and I was by myself. Know, right? My team didn't know. And it was like right around entourage, like towards the end of it that I was like really having to like concentrate more on my walking and concentrate more on covering up like sensations that I felt like were throwing me off, worrying I was going to pee my pants, <laughs> like really uncomfortable things that like you're sitting there and you're trying to have a scene with somebody and like squeezing your whole body to stay strong. Mm -hmm. And then I got just like in bad habits, to be honest, very honest after that, where in my everyday life, let alone when I was trying to perform, I was so tr trying to hide what was going on with myself that I was being fake all the time. So I was trying, so it was just back about giving everybody what they wanted and, and, and giving everybody what I thought they would want. And so every audition and every even job that I got, it wasn't my best work for a really long time. And I'm really grateful to the universe for keeping me employed in ways to keep my health insurance and keep me afloat and keep me going. But it was really, really hard. And it took all the joy out of the work for me. It was just every single day was how do i get through this without getting found out and my hardest hardest one was i shot this i got this pilot for it was lifetime i would play this detective it was myself and sherry stringfield and you know i had been able to cover things up enough during that time up until then and it was our very first day of work and they were like, okay, Jamie, you're, you're going to go to this house and we want you to run across the street. And I'm going to tell you, so every script I ever read, if I ever saw that she had to run or do anything, I would tell my agents, I'm not interested. And for some reason, I was naive enough that in this pilot, there was never a scene that it said she ran. So I thought I'll be fine. And I show there, I, of course, I show up on the very first day of work and they're telling very first scene, very first moment. And he's like, you got to run across the street and I can't run. My ability to run had been taken from me a couple of years prior. And God thankfully put some stunt man behind me that could see me struggling. I, I swear to God, it was a guardian angel. I can't explain it to you, but he whispered in my ear, I'm going to hold the back of your vest and I'm going to hold you up while we run across the street. And I was like, thank you. It was truly like, I can't, it was divine. But that shoot was the hardest of my life. It should have been my dream come true. I was the lead of this like huge pilot. And it was this great show. It's Josh Berman, who's still a friend of mine. And I love him so much. But like every day I would get a call from my manager being like, hey, they're calling me saying like, is something wrong with your ankle? Is something wrong with your walking? people would come up like, well, listen, when this show gets picked up, you got to get it together, Jamie. Like you got to figure out what's going on with your body. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm mean, having this dream come true and a nightmare, quite frankly, at the very same time. And it still wasn't enough for me to tell anybody or ask for help. I, I literally would pray every day that the show didn't get, get picked up. You I prayed that. every day after that. It did. And it didn't. <laughs> Because if it did, I don't know what would have happened. Um, and then after that, I ended up booking a sitcom on NBC. And same thing every day. Are you limping? What's going on? And what should have been a joyous 18 episodes was a nightmare. And during that time, during that show is when I finally told my manager at the time he came to one of the tapings and he didn't say anything to me and we were walking back to my room and i just started crying and he's like what is going on and i was like i am so sorry i'm so sorry that i have lied to you all this time but i was diagnosed with ms 10 years ago and i don't know how to do this i don't know how to navigate this business nobody's gonna want me with this I can't control my body in the way that I used to. I'm so sorry. And he, I remember he just like gave me this huge bear hug and all he could tell me was that he was proud of me. Yeah. And I couldn't believe that that's how it was being received. It was my first time really, you know, saying it out loud to somebody outside of my immediate circle. 
And he said, I have got your back until you're ready. You know, and I had gotten pregnant shortly after that. And I had said to him, like, I'm going to take a beat because then our show got canceled. And I was like, I'm going to take a minute to have this baby and figure out myself yeah. and, and, and what's, what, how I'm going to move forward with this because I realized that the way I was doing it, I just couldn't do it anymore. Well, it's so hard. It's one thing to have a secret, right? And they say, even as a technique for acting, have a secret. It'll be so interesting yeah. to watch when, when the secret is eating you alive and not mm -hmm. allowing you to be fully expressive. And yet you're getting everything you've ever wanted. I can't imagine that, that tear inside of you. Yeah. So yeah. In that moment. And I'm so curious after having your baby, because that's a whole other thing in this business, right? Where oh, yeah. Everything shifts. All of a sudden, you're not the person you were before. You have mm -hmm. this grace of a new beginning mm -hmm. where you landed in your creativity of wanting to either continue coming back to this or <laughs> exploring new things. Yeah. Um, I really, I, I, that's, I really thought about quitting. Mm-hmm. I really, really did. And everyone kept telling me no. And I was like, I really genuinely thought that all of my reps would have been like, good for you. You've, you've done great. Yeah. yeah. I really thought that everyone was going to be like, yeah, Jamie, go, 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 go live your life. Go. And because I just didn't think I had any real value. Like I thought I was doing them a favor. And it was really surprising to me that they wanted me to continue. But again, I've realized that I couldn't do it the way I had been doing it. And so when my son was about two, I had done like one or two things here and there in between just to keep my insurance. Yes. Yeah. Like just if like a random Hallmark offer came in or something like that, I'd be like, yep, I'm going to do it great because it's great money and I'll have my insurance for the year and then I'm, I'm still not doing this anymore. And were you telling production at that point? Because Hallmark is the most family-oriented, loving, supportive place. No, they thought I had a herniated disc. That's what I said. That's what you guys decided to land yeah. on revealing. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't ready yet. I just wasn't. And then I was finally going to get married because we got we did it the not old-fashioned way and had our baby first. Love and that. my husband and I were going to get married. And I can't quite say what it was, although I did go to a hypnotist once and I'll never forget. I was walking up to his house and I was looking down and he said to me as I was walking up, why are you looking down at the ground? And I was like, oh, I don't know. And he's like, why won't you look at me? And I kind of stared at him a little bit and he's like i want you to come inside and tr think about that answer and when i sat across from him i said i don't like to watch you watch me move yeah and he said okay and i want you to take some deep breaths and he like immediately put me under hypnosis and that was a thing i was so ashamed to have this disease i was so embarrassed to walk the way i walked i was i was just i hate that i felt that way but i did and when i came out of that session i just remember feeling this like i i can't keep this a secret anymore this is killing me this is hurting me this is a whole unnecessary layer of suffering that i'm putting on myself when my life is already hard yeah. and i talked to my husband about it i talked to some of my friends and they were all like oh thank god like please we've been dying for this and i remember i called my manager he was like we've got this don't worry and i was really ready for whatever reaction it would have been i wasn't expecting like the world to like stop and be like oh have you heard about jamie and i never felt myself to be important but i just i was just interested to see how the you the industry would the industry would, would react respond. because nobody nobody had ms at that or at point, least said they did yes nobody was outwardly speaking about it yes. no one no one and so i was getting married at the time and people magazine was doing a little story on it and so i felt well what a beautiful moment for me to be able to share this and so i did and i'll never forget like three days later i got like a call for an audition and i was i was hysterical because i just couldn't 
believe that somebody was still willing to see me despite having MS. How wonderful was that audition to be fully present in who you were? Truly. Even it still, it still took time though. I was still trying to walk normal. I was still trying to look normal. It, it, it still took time for me to adjust how I navigated the, the world. Like it really, there was an adjustment period of now, okay, people are looking at me and they know I have this thing. So I should be okay just moving the way I move. But it's, it's, it really took me a lot of, it took me from 2016 to 2020. To get comfortable and have, and then once you step, now we're in self tapes. Right. We're in the land. Yeah. (laughs) But what happened in 2020, what I'll tell you is that so every job that I had done from 2016 to 2020 was still we working around it. Mm -hmm. We'll hide it. We'll we'll shoot around it. And which was great. And I felt very grateful for that. But in 2020, I got this audition for this pilot. I'm sure you saw it. Do you remember a pilot called Triage? Yes. Yeah. John Chu directed it. It was this beautiful pilot. It took place in three different decades. And it was about your relationship to medicine, time and people over the course of decades and took place in this hospital with all these different characters. And I had this audition for this girl, Alyssa, and she was this Jewish girl from New York. I mean, it was like perfect. It was for me. And it was all on Zoom. So no one had to see me walk into a room. I didn't have the 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 anxiety of like standing up for two minutes before I knew my name was going to call, get called so I could get loose with my legs so I wasn't too stiff when I walked in and then worry that, oh God, is this how she always walks? Like there was such a, when I would have auditions on lots mm-hmm. and you know how far you have to walk? Walks, yes. I would show up an hour and a half early so I could walk a couple of steps and take a rest. Like I never asked I didn't want to ask for any extra treatment, which I should have been able to, right? Anyone that has any sort of disability, but I couldn't accept the fact that I was disabled still at that time. So having it on Zoom was like a lot of the pressure was off. So I was finally able to just kind of be like Lucy Goosey Jamie. And what's beautiful is when I got the part, the creators asked me if they would be willing if I would be willing to have MS be part of my character's journey. And she was going to get diagnosed in the first decade and be trying to come to terms with it in that middle decade and then just in full ownership and in her power in the third. And I just couldn't believe the gift that was given to me in that moment. And that forever changed me completely. Well, they... I mean, I have so many emotions that I'm just I'm so grateful for you sharing this. Um, yeah. Not only on this mic, but like in the world, really. And life imitates art. Art imitates life. And we need to see reflections. You know, we see struggles all the time, right? There's yeah. movies and television shows made about loss, made about divorce, made about love, made about this. Where is it in support of our bodies changing or being out of control of our bodies or trying to reconcile how we how we think about ourselves how we feel about ourselves yeah to be able to have uh, a show like this showrunners be able to meet you at the door and only take and a big part of what television shows are and when people listen to this podcast or start to work in this business for a while they hire you and then they bring you into the writers rooms to be like so tell us more about yourself so they can write they have things yes. to write yes for you and i just am so incredibly gracious that you shared the journey to get to that place where you allowed yourself to be seen so that so that the world could support you not only in that but like you could help so many people oh, i want to because i don't want anybody to go through what i went through it was so hard and so unnecessary you know especially in the beautiful age that we are in now of inclusivity and representation it's just like how could i so the where i am now so after triage yep. i am it took almost a year to find out if it was going to get picked up. It was like down to the bitter end and it didn't, unfortunately. And obviously that was a heartbreak. 
during that time, I felt I like many people in COVID, I got out of LA with my family. I've had a second baby during that time too. I have two little boys now, they're 10 and six, and we moved to Austin, Texas. And we just needed an adventure and we needed to, you know, try this something new. And again, divinely from the universe, when I moved here and triage didn't get picked up, I got a call from ABC because it was the same network that there was a little guest star role, recurring role on Big Sky, shooting in Albuquerque, very close to Austin. And would I be interested? And I was like, sure. I just put me on the phone with the showrunner. I just need him to understand me and my body. And I talked to Elwood, who's amazing man. And I said, listen, I can't run and I can't really walk that far. I can walk a couple of steps here and there to look normal. I'm assuming you don't, this character is, you know, just to service your story. I, 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 and he's like, we'll work around it. Another, which was fine. I, this maybe wasn't the moment for me to have MS. I thought it needed to be a big moment for me to have MS for the first time on the screen. I was telling myself that story. I don't think that that was necessarily the right choice, but this little role ended up becoming a series regular yeah. and that experience well first let me not gloss over the fact that in the first episode my character was supposed to run and they built me a rig where i was sitting on a trailer with a camera in front of me and i was strapped in and the cameraman was strapped in and the guy chasing me was behind me and so it was only shooting from my like chest up and i would just move my arms and it looked like i was running so i got to like instead of having a stunt double do the thing they got to film me looking like i was terrified this this man was chasing me trying to kill me which was so beautiful and so amazing i i was crying the crew was crying because they were all proud of themselves too yes they they really enjoyed, they kept telling me they're like we loved this process of like trying to figure out how to make this work for you yes yes which was a beautiful lesson because i was always so worried about being a burden I was, I've always prided myself on being an easy person to work with and you don't have to worry about me and I don't need anything extra. And I, I still want to be that girl. I'm a team player. You know, I come from the theater and where I understand that every single person is like a cut is, is a part of this machine that makes us go. I am no more important than anyone. I learned that lesson from day one on Sopranos, like top to bottom, there was the utmost respect for everybody on that show and i will be forever grateful that that was my first experience and my lessons of this industry especially from some of those people but to continue on that show and to have them continue to want me back made me trust in my talent again and not and that i had worth because for a very long time i thought i had none you know yeah well, not I'm not agreeing with that, but I understand. I agree. I agree with that. Not that you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I know what you're trying to say. I I think it's so interesting beyond somebody that's working with a disability or working with something in their body that uh, we as women. I'm gonna I'm gonna make it a gender thing. We don't yeah. want to. We don't want to impose on anybody. Mm -hmm. We don't want to ask for help. You know, even down to when actors say like, "Well, can I ask that question in the audition?" Yes. Can yes. I ask them for the script? Yes. Can I ask for what I need to do my job? Even down to like Sandra. Oh, I saw this wonderful interview that she did where she went and she went in for sideways. She's like, I'm going to need a minute and laid on the floor for a few minutes. <laughs> I found such, I found such joy in seeing other people ask for what they need. Yeah. To be able to showcase their talent. Absolutely. And what a beautiful life lesson to come full circle, to get to that place of knowing that you can ask for help, that people are actually so excited to be a part of that help. Oh my God. That's I would show purpose. up to work every day and every new director, RADs had the whole conversation with them already. So I never had to. They're like, here's Jamie Steele. So work, this is how you're going to do it with her. They park my trailer right up next to set. Every time I showed up, there was somebody holding their arm, ready to walk me in. It was like this seamless dance that we all figured out together. And it was so beautiful. But when I finished that job and it got canceled, I made a promise to myself. And I said, I will never not represent myself on screen again. I'm done working around this because I want to give myself 
the best performance opportunity to give the best performance I can give. And that's in the body that I'm in. You know, I, it is. And I love that you finally have gotten to a place of, damn, you're so talented. And who, <laughs> who cares if you need X, Y, and Z to be able to show that talent, just like any other actor gets to demand a quiet set, right? Mm-hmm. So they can show their talent or give their talent over to, in service of the story. I'm so glad that you found your emotional crutch to support you to stand so tall. And share like yeah, you're such a talent. You're such a force. That means a lot to me. Thank you. Oh gosh, since you've been seven years old, you've known what you're meant to do. So how great that you get to uh, blend the two things, you know? Yeah. To be able to show that. And I'm looking at it as a gift. You know, I think that this is this is something I could bring that maybe could enrich a role and it doesn't have to be about this because my life is not all about ms like i am a mom and a wife and a daughter and a sister and a friend and so many things i just happen to limp my way through all of the things you know what i mean but it's not it doesn't define me and it took me so long to realize that and our podcast messy is that's what it's about and you said it so beautifully at the beginning it it has not necessarily anything to do with ms it's like that's just our thing, but we all have things that 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 come with us, mm-hmm. that come along with us. And what I hope to do with our podcast is take people on a journey of watching two women trying to accept something that is hard, which we all have to try to do in our lives, some many things sometimes. How can we accept it and love ourselves and life enough to just keep going? And and we are helping each other through that and also understanding that you cannot and should never do it alone, which I also tried to do for a very long time. And it's as human beings, we need each other. And that's the sto- that's the stories that we tell. Yes, it's you, you can't you can't act in a vacuum. You can't. No. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't it doesn't work. Also, just. I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful for the podcast. I'm so grateful for you going through the process and. Not only that, like developing so many other things to help people, not only with MS, but just come, to, like you said, come come to the table fully as a full human, as a, a fully allowing the dark in with the light yeah. so that you can be fully accepted and comfortable and calm in who you are. Because that's a big part of, I think, getting to be human. Yeah. Yet, we try in these professions to make it look perfect. We try mm-hmm. even in our auditions to be perfect. Yeah. Only to realize after 10, 20 years in it, you're like, oh, they don't want perfect. They actually want messy. I book the most when I'm messy. I book the most yep. when I make the mistakes because the human comes in. It's How only you- it's only recently clicked for me with that because, again, I've, I got in a really bad habit of just trying to give them what I thought they wanted in every audition and now, like I said, where I'm like, no, I'm going to give you me and trust that that will be enough. And, you know, a lot of the things I've learned, I created this three-step guide with Novartis. It's at reframingms.com. But it's really, I feel like for anybody, because the three steps are reflect, reframe, reach out. So reflect means sitting with the hard stuff, grief sadness, depression. Like for me, the grief was like for my old body. I wasn't always like this. I was a dancer. I did Beauty and the Beast on Broadway for nine months. You know, I was like, I was healthy and strong and I am a disabled woman now. And having to come to terms with that and allow myself the permission to feel really mad and feel really sad it was important for me to give myself the opportunity to do that. By the way, this is also not like a three step and done. This is like something I come back to regularly to get through these moments. And then the second is reframe, right? So it's like, okay, this is, this is the cards that I'm being dealt. These are the things that I'm dealing with. How do I have to reframe my life to still move forward with what I want? I still want to be an actress. So what does this mean? How do I reframe? How do I ask? And then the third is reach out. So how do I ask for the help that I need, including having the rep- the conversations with my representatives saying, I want you 
every audition, every incoming call, every outgoing call, you tell them that I have MS because I don't want it to be a surprise because I'm going to tell you, and I, and I understand it and I get it, but I have lost roles because of this. One in particular was, it was a hard pill to swallow. Again, it's like, I get it. I didn't get the role because they feared the male lead would not look good if he because in the character had to break up with my character like he would not look good because he broke up with a woman that had a disability oh god it sucks to hear yes but it's like the reality of what i'm dealing with but again like i don't want this to i don't want to get down to the wire and have to deal with this i need to lead with this i've i've had it hit it for so long that i'm i am proud to lead with this because again the person that's going to look at me and think that's an asset and that's going to add to this story is the job that i want that's the that's the environment you want to be in that's where i because that's where i'm going to do my best work and give somebody the best performance i can give i also think that those three r's could be used hourly Yes, you know, exactly. Like living your life and you're yeah. like, hold on a second. Yeah. Let me reflect. Let me on, feel this feeling. Let me feel this. Let me see how I can refrain, reframe all of this. And how can I reach out now to have somebody help me through this moment? Like, it yes. really, and, and just to be able to articulate it through the lens of what you're going through, but it is so adaptable to so many other things. We have a society, we as artists, it's such a thing. We think that we're on our own. We're doing it by ourselves. And sometimes it can feel really, really lonely. Yeah. And I think the only way, that's a big reason why this podcast exists. I wanted to pull back the, the, the veil on some of the things that were happening. So other actors you could know what somebody else gets for their contract you could know what you could ask for in an audition you could know uh, why don't we talk about those things well i told you when we signed on to the zoom that i have been a faithful listener of this podcast because i it's it's so important to hear what other actors are going through and feeling and knowing that you're not alone and 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 understanding that this is hard and this is beautiful and we and and it is a very unique calling and when you have that calling and that fire it's you you can't ignore it you just can't and to know that you're part of this tribe of people that go through what you go through is really important so thank you for doing this podcast because it's really helped me in many times and i know so many other people thank you yeah thank you so much for saying that thank you so much for coming on oh i am so happy to i was so excited when we got you scheduled this week and honestly i don't think it could have been a better time i really you, you know what there's I, always divine timing it's what i say and i needed this conversation just as much truly in this very moment so thank you i did too i did too Aww. where can everybody messy is on all Everyone yes you get your podcast please yeah we're listen. god i i was it's me and christina applegate and who also lives with ms and she is a force as we all know and one of the funniest people and we we talk about we like to say the deepest darkest parts of ourselves that you think no one would ever love me if they knew this and then oh how loved how much we love each other the two of us with what we share and and the reaction that we've gotten and from other people we hope we give them the permission to feel like they can share as well we also have incredible guests like you said we had edie falco on we had martin short jimmy kimmel we have ed o'neill we have such yes. great friends coming on and it's it's been a real beautiful experience and you're just listening to basically what christina and i talk about on the phone like this yes. is a, it's not it's know, not I formatted like, it's a mess <laughs> i feel like it's great i was like i just feel like i'm sitting there having breakfast with them right now Nothing yeah be better okay. i'm still like everybody else like coming out of the strike like trying to like feeling the slowness of it all i'm like in it with you all right now you know Day by day, audition yep. by audition. And that's right. Same thing. But just, I, I will say that I've finally relaxed into, I've loosened my grip is like the only way I can describe it. I've, I've been proven enough times by the universe to just trust in the timing of when things need to be. There's times where I felt like things were really slow and dried up. And in hindsight, I look back, I'm like, wow, my family really needed me during that time. So I'm just going to keep trusting where I'm at and doing the work and be ready when it's time.
it's going to be, I can't wait to see when it's time. I have just, a, I'm just curious, have you dabbled in writing or directing yet? <laughs> I have no desire to direct. Okay. None, none. Okay. Writing, I dabble, but I have been approached about creating a show. And I'm, I have years of notes in my phone and I have many years of experience. And I think there could be an interesting story story to tell that's a little bit of mine and a little bit of yours and a little bit of a lot of people's that, you know, if it's meant to be, hopefully will be. Well, we'll, we'll wait and see. We'll yeah. Wait and see. I just felt that burn. I was like, oh, I just, yes. I yeah. I feel that for you. Thank Very you. Nice. Jamie, thank you so much. Oh, so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you.